Well, welcome everyone to Tear Down That Wall of Text, a web writer's workshop. Thank you so much to N10 and the 22 NTC. Um, I'm really hoping that 23 will be in person. This is my 20th year as um, a member of N10. Um, that's a long time. And I would like for it to be in person someday again. Um, next slide, beep. For those old enough to re remember the beeping noise in school slide progression, that is what I'm going to use. Um, I'm Johanna Bates, co-owner and co-principal of Dev Collaborative. We um, build websites exclusively for nonprofits in WordPress and Drupal. Clayton, do you want to introduce and yourself? Hi, I'm Clayton Dewey. I'm the product owner at Dev Collaborative. So I focus on content strategy and user experience design. And hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Leinberger. I am the manager of strategy and operations at the Social Innovation Forum. Uh, which is a nonprofit that's lucky enough to work with Dev Collaborative. Yeah. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and uh, um, let me just go over a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the session details. Um, we have a collaborative notes doc, um, and it's in linked to from our socio page, which I just put in the Zoom chat. Um, and please feel free to use that. Um, and I will be um, putting a link to the slides there after the presentation. Sorry, I was gonna do that while we were having technical difficulties. Um, but this is, I, I just put a link to the collaborative notes doc in the Zoom chat as well. And at the end of the session, um, there is a survey evaluation for your feedback. Um, we and um, N10 really do take that feedback um, to heart. So please do take the time to fill that out if you're able to, we appreciate it. Um, and a quick overview of our session today. Um, Clayton and Michelle and I are going to go over some of the key concepts um, in writing for the web. Um, things that if you pay attention to even one or two of them when you um, edit or review or write content for the web, um, it's gonna be better. Um, and we're gonna move through that fairly quickly uh, because we're hoping to have at least 15 to 20 minutes at the end um, to live workshop a piece of content um, here on the call and to take any questions that you might have. So if you're feeling brave today and you, and you have a wall of text nonprofit web page that you would like to share during this presentation, please feel free to put it in the Zoom chat um, as well as any questions that come up and we'll, we'll be addressing those at the end. And if everyone's feeling shy and nobody has a piece of content, um, we do have something that we can use. Um, and we are going to be using real examples from our work. And um, Michelle is going to talk about the process of rewriting her organizational content um, as well. So um, take it away, Clayton. Yeah, and I'll add one other note about the recording. So I checked with the NTC staff, and the recording will be made available eventually to us as a file that we can then post on YouTube and whatever. And so we, we could trim that part out if you all wanted to share in session, but didn't want it living in perpetuity. Either way, it's totally fine with us. Um, so yeah, so let's start with how people read on the web or how oftentimes how people don't read on the web. Um, rather than reading word for word, line by line, like we do with our favorite novel, we're oftentimes hunting for answers. And yet much of online content is still written for print and that assumption that people are going to be reading um, all of the text on a page. Um, so here's a typical example of this. This is from a client of ours, Bay Area Legal Services. They are a nonprofit. Um, a team of lawyers who offer free legal um, help to people in the, uh, the Tampa Bay area. And they came to us and knew that their site was making people feel a bit of overwhelmed, uh, frustrated, disoriented with their legal issue that they had. And, you know, here's a, here's a closer look at that. And of course, you know, the, the design is outdated. And so that contributes to that feeling that this information is dense and hard to understand. Um, but we're also seeing it's very text heavy. And um, just to a fun way to date this is, you know, if you're not finding what you need, 
just email us at balls-info at balls.org with the subject line more info. It's as simple as that, right? Um, so they wanted to update their website so that the information they had on um, online was something that was a, an initially helpful, reassuring experience for people. And so we worked with them, you know, and together we said, tear down that wall of text and replace it with icons, relevant pictures, headings, a modern design, reassuring color palette, concise and plain language. And as a result, uh, traffic is up, time on page is up, um, people coming with their first questions to Bay Area when they call the hotline, they're coming more prepared because they've they've gotten some of the information that they need on their situation from their website. Um, so that is part of the power of writing for the web. Uh, so let's, let's dive in again to how people read or don't read on the web. So if people are hunting for answers, there's a few different patterns that come up. Uh, one is called the F pattern. Um, because as you can see, if we're scanning headings and then generally starting on the left hand side of text for um, languages like English that are left to right, it makes a vaguely an F shape. Um, and this example, so this is a video of eye tracking software. So the circle is where this person's eyes are on the page. And so as you can see, they're hopping around from keyword to keyword, uh, looking for information. In this case, uh, they're reading the specifications of a camera that they're thinking of buying. So rather than seeing that circle move steadily left to right, line by line, it's hopping all over the place, hunting for answers. Um, there's a few other patterns that people use all with very fun names. We've got the layer cake where you're scanning headings. We've got the spotted pattern, which is a lot of what you saw in that earlier video of you're just kind of hopping around the page looking for keywords, links stand out to our eyes, digits stand out to our eyes, or the marking pattern. You pick a particular point on the page and start scanning down. The point being, um, there's different patterns, but all of them are skimming and scanning. Um, there is one important exception to that, the commitment pattern. This is where you are reading everything on the page. This happens if you're reading a text that's at a challenging level, maybe English is a second language, maybe it's an academic paper. Um, it could also be because you have a high trust in the source and you wanna, you wanna read it um, carefully and thoughtfully. Another is technical writing. So if you're reading, um, uh, if you're a developer, for example, reading how to implement a new web development feature, or if you're following a recipe or maybe some kind of fix it guide following instructions. But still, a lot of times we do that skimming and scanning first and then settle into this commitment pattern. So since we're hunting for information, we want to give those hunters an information set. Examples of these are titles, headings, lists, bold words, emphasized words. Um, one thing is when you're writing links, it's helpful to write what that link is, is taking you to and what you're doing there. So rather than a link that says click here, um, you know, stating read, the, read our annual report, uh, download this toolkit, uh, et cetera. And the good news is that when we do this, everyone benefits. People using screen readers, people where English is a second language, it's easier to translate, it's better for search engine optimization, it's better for all readers. So now that we've established some of those universal best practices for writing on the web, the next thing that will really help uh, improve your writing and improve the engagement of your content is keeping your audience in mind. So a common tool that we uh, can use to think about our audience is the persona. So a persona is a fictitious yet realistic depiction 
of the key audience groups that you have. So in the case of Bay Area Legal Services, they have three key audience groups, the client who's got a legal problem, uh, the pro bono lawyer who's looking to volunteer, and the donor who wants to donate to Bay Area to expand um, their legal, the legal help that they can give to people. All of them have distinct needs. All of them have distinct kind of vocabulary that they're coming with, background information they're coming with. Um, so uh, different pages on the site will be uh, more important to different audience groups. And so you should be writing accordingly. And one thing that we oftentimes do is we overestimate um, the literacy level of those who are coming to our site. So as you can see with this chart, um, even just even writing at an eighth grade level, uh, you're only reaching like 50 percent of the U.S. population. Um, and that, you know, that can shift up or down depending on your constituents. But in the nonprofit world where we're serving people who are under resourced or at, at a certain disadvantage, um, that's oftentimes even more pronounced. So keeping that in mind. Uh, a lot of us also have a global audience, so be aware of idioms, figures of speech that might not translate for people or might be difficult to understand initially. Um, which leads us to a similar issue, jargon, which I'll let Johanna talk about. Yes, um, I've been uh, writing nonprofit content for the web since 1999, and jargon has always been a thing that um, has been there. Um, and it's great to question whether any jargon you're using makes sense for your audience. And of course, sometimes it will, but it's just really great to question the jargon that you're using. Every community has jargon. Think about the tech community certainly has jargon. The nonprofit, um, the nonprofit community certainly has jargon and your organization probably has internal jargon. And often it's, it's a shorthanded way we talk about things with each other when we're in a community. Um, but um, it's important to know that even if you think people can understand it, they may be glazing over or feel excluded or not understand what you're saying if you're using too much jargon. Um, jargon is so prevalent in uh, the nonprofit sector that, next slide, beep, um, <laughs> that TechSoup has a nonprofit jargon generator that is really fun. I ran it the first four times. I got some great stuff here. Achievable, configurable, achieve configurable community engagement. Cultivate community-centric funding sources. Pioneer network-centric triple wins. <laughs> My favorite, synergize a transparent sustainability. <laughs> Yeah, it is great for long passwords. Excellent comment. <laughs> this should be your passwords, not a random string of text. Synergize, what does it mean? I don't want to know. Okay, moving on. Next slide, meep. Clear writing is great writing. This is true everywhere and it's certainly true on the web. So when you're using jargon or longer words um, or any words, is it understandable outside of your organization or niche? Do you need to reach people outside of your organization or niche? Are you striving for better inclusion with your website content? Jargon can be a form of gatekeeping. Anyone who's ever walked into a room full of developers talking in developer code talk knows how that can feel, including myself who is a developer. Um, so just be, be mindful of um, inclusiveness and use jargon as a checkpoint for that as well. Are there simpler or clearer words you can use? And simpler writing is easier to translate, whether someone is using Google Translate on your site or whether you have a staff translator or a freelance translator who's translating your content. I'm um, using simpler words will make that simpler as well. And for the rest of this presentation, we're gonna focus on two main things that um, you can kind of zero in on to improve your writing on the web. One is using plain language, um, and uh, Clayton and Michelle are going to talk more about that, as well as the principle of show, not tell. So, Clayton and Michelle. All right. Um, so, 
we are working with Dev Collaborative to um, re, re kind of design our website. And, and as we're going through that process, we took the opportunity to refresh some of the content on our web page. Um, and so this is what we started with, which is on our about page. Uh, the Social Innovation Forum provides a unique combination of capacity building and network building to create positive social change in greater Boston. We actively connect supporters, funders, investors, and volunteers, and practitioners, nonprofit, and social business leaders to build productive relationships focused on growing social impact, founded in 2003 as a program of root cause, SIF incorporated as an independent nonprofit organization in 2015. So that's quite a mouthful. Um, and what Clayton was really helpful um, to, what Clayton really helped our team do is kind of say like, what do we actually need to say? And so he introduced us to a tool called the Hemingway Editor, um, which tells you what uh, grade level or you know reading level your text is uh, reading at. And so you can see this is at a postgraduate level. So you would need a master's or a PhD to understand what's going on. Um, and I think this is really common for nonprofits, you know, speaking for our organization and probably for many of yours, we're a really small team um, and everyone's doing everything. And so the people who are writing grants are also the people who are updating and building the website because that totally makes sense as an overlap for skills. Um, and because no one has time to do anything, we're doing a lot of copying and pasting. So we're copying things that we wrote for a grant and we're putting it on our website, even though, you know, funders probably represent a third of the people that are visiting our website. And there's a lot of nonprofit staff members or uh, leaders who are visiting our website. And, you know, they're skimming for information because they're pressed for time and they're trying to fill out other grants and figure out if our program is a good fit for them. And they don't have time, you know, to read and say like, oh, I need a PhD for this. Like, I'm going to spend time sitting with this about page. Um, and they really need answers quickly. Um, so this isn't really a good fit for, you know, up to two thirds of the people who are visiting our website. Yeah, and it can be a, a bit intimidating thinking about how, what are you going to say instead? Um, and one piece of advice is to think again to your audience and think what would you say to them in person if I was face to face with a nonprofit leader and they asked me, so what's the social innovation form about? You know, I might say something like, well, we connect to nonprofits with funders and we work in Boston. Um, we also help nonprofits with our accelerator, capacity camps and alumni network. Um, so uh, so that's, a, that's a great way to just think about how would you say this in plain language? You know, if somebody were to come and, and ask me and I had given that original pitch, you know, the, their eyes would probably start glazing over by like sentence three. Um, so here's an example of just using kind of to the point, plain language. Um, and the other thing is, you know, like with all kind of machine generated tools, there's going to be a limit there. I mean, we see here that it's saying that it's a grade 10 reading level and, you know, it'd be nice to get it down to a grade eight or grade nine. And this is where jargon comes into play again. And, um, and so Michelle has a, has a good story on that and kind of how to consider what words to use. Thanks, Clayton. Yeah, so we, when we were kind of editing down um, this uh, about paragraph to this uh, couple of sentences, you know, we talked about, I think the, the word that was kind of sending it up a little higher in the grade level readability was nonprofits and accelerator and capacity camp, uh, you know, those kinds of words. And so we played around with changing it to something like, you know, we help change makers or, or, you know, words like that. And I think what we kind of talked about internally is that none of us could decide what change makers meant. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. this jargon was appropriate because the people who are visiting our websites will know what our accelerator is, or, you know, we'll be able to see from reading more about the program um, and not, and they'll know who the nonprofits are. They'll know who the funders are. Um, and so that this jargon felt appropriate for this section. Mm -hmm. um, and when we first kind of edited it all down, 
one of my coworkers was kind of like, oh no, we're losing so much depth. Like, no, you know, we do so much and how can we reduce it down to this much? Um, and it's sort of like that writing principle of kill your darlings of, you know, we all want to shove everything that we know about our work into, um, you know, a couple of sentences, but you'll just end up with, <laughs> with uh, something that doesn't make any sense. And so really we thought about, you know, how can we just convey enough that people will visit our website or click another link to go to the programs page and learn more about our programs and we don't have to shove everything into one paragraph. Yeah, which brings us to that show not tell principle. Um, and so, you know, here's an example of what the, the about page could look like um, with that updated concise language. Um, and so in this case, you know, rather than two paragraphs of text explaining everything that the SIF does, we have a concise statement here, and then you can explain um, what the social innovator accelerator program is here, you know, it's six months of consultation leading to a pitch video prospectus and presentation to influential funders. And what's the alumni program it's an online community of nonprofit leaders that are helping each other. Um, and this is where you know we can embrace the layered interactive nature of the web and websites and linking off to further information right once you click through to the social innovator accelerator page then we can go into depth more about what does that consultation look like what what are some of the outcomes that other nonprofits have experienced by going through that program um, so we're you know progressively disclosing information at a time um, so, so far we've spent most of our time focusing on the written word. Um, and so we did want to spend a little bit of time here talking about rich media, right? Because we do want to be bringing in some of those other interactive pieces of conveying information. So video is great for emotion. Um, when you're using it, be sure to use uh, closed captions and have a transcript that's good for screen readers and for SEO and for just reinforcing that information for people. Uh, when it comes to images, um, try to avoid stock photos if you can. We, um, you know, we can sense when something is staged, and it's always better to use genuine photography. If you're using images, include a caption if you can, if it makes sense, and definitely include alternative text for screen readers again and for SEO. Uh, so now we'll talk about convincing your stakeholders to buy in on this process. Yes, stakeholders. Um, we all have some. Um, and um, meep. Um, yeah, you may have heard things when you're like, hey, we really need to revisit some of our content. We need to focus on rewriting our content. You may have heard things like, we don't have time. We have more important things to do. The website reads well to me. Larry writes the web content and he thinks it's fine. <laughs> um, or my favorite, the website needs technical and visual design whiz bang instead of a content rewrite. Um, and you know, you need a JavaScript animation engagement tactic when really the reality is that the words that you are using on your website nine times out of 10 in a nonprofit context are the most important thing on your website. So um, how do you convince stakeholders? Well. Um, the main tactics I recommend are to remind them yeah. that they and their audiences and the audiences that you're serving are not the same people. You can show them evidence. It's me. Um, I'm right here. Tasia. What do you, what do you, um, right what do here. analytics and research and user research say about your content? What pages are most popular on your site? What pages does your organization wish were most popular, were more popular on your site? Um, and, you know, identify it. If you find an ident a problematic piece of content on your site, um, identify that. And then um, think about the audiences that you're trying to serve and ask three questions. So go to your stakeholders with your content and say, hey, stakeholders, remember these people? These who are, this is who we're trying to reach with this content. And then ask the three questions. Who is this content for? Hint, it's for those people that we just 
reviewed. Um, what do they want? And what do you as an organization want them to do? What are your business goals? And the sweet spot for your content is going to be um, in that place that overlaps between what you would like users to do on your site, the things that you would like them to get from, from your content and where that crosses over with um, what they are seeking, what they need. There's a wonderful video about this um, put out by the Nielsen Norman Group um, that I've linked to in the resources slide. It's really short and it's really clear. So I encourage you to, um, to give that a look um, later. Um, and it can be overwhelming if you have lots of walls of text on your website. Um, and you might wonder, where do I start? Clayton, where do they start? Yeah, so some good places to start are you know, pages that are getting a lot of traffic but have poor conversion um, or have a, have a lower time on page than you would expect if they were really engaging with the content. Um, pages that have high bounce rates where people are coming to the page and then immediately leaving, not going elsewhere on your site as you expect. Uh, or if you've run any usability tests or if you do run some usability tests, that's a really great way to identify pages that are um, that are maybe confusing or overwhelming to people as well. And th this again is, is an opportunity to embrace the nature of the web and the nature of content management systems where um, you can change something and you can change it again if you need to. And that's also helpful to keep in mind if you get stuck in the sort of like um, writing by committee and wordsmithing something to death and feeling very shy about making a final change before getting it absolutely perfect. You can, you can start with a version and then you can always change it again later if you want. Um, so some tools to help you with that process. Uh, the Hemingway app um, is what we, sh we showed earlier and we'll be using again in our demonstration. The Conscious Style Guide is a great resource. Um, plain language guidelines. This one's really nice. This gets into some nitty gritty of how to write plain language that goes even more specific than what we've shown in this presentation. Um, and then if you have a Drupal or a WordPress site, um, there's modu modules and plugins there that can help your editors. And so these two give like visual feedback to editors of areas where they're, the content that they're writing or the images they're using aren't accessible and how to fix that. And then the biggest mistakes in writing for the web, that's that video that Johanna mentioned earlier. And it's, um, it's not that long, so it's, it's really great um, information in a short amount of time there. Uh, so let's apply what we've learned, um, and I haven't, Check the chat. I don't know, Johanna or Michelle, is anybody, I, yeah. anyone brave out there? So, well, first of all, we have um, a really good question. Um, we have a really good question from, from Jamie um, from Appalachian, Appalachian Voices um, about multiple audiences and addressing multiple audiences. And there's been some comments about, you know, they're, they're needing to be um, different reading levels, sometimes higher levels of reading level, wow, um, are appropriate and sometimes jargon is appropriate. So yeah. we can definitely address some of those questions. Um, but um, we had someone submit a page that they would like, that is a wall of text, but they said that maybe not on a recorded video. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. is any if anyone has a page that they are willing, we will not be mean unless you tell us to be mean. <laughs> Um, we're not here to be mean, but we are happy to offer some helpful actual feedback on a wall of text. Oh, Jamie says um, that they are happy to provide one. That would be awesome if you can put the link in the Zoom chat. Um, and um, thank you. Um, oh, awesome. Cole Impacts. Um, Yes, there are a lot of words at the top of that page. There are some things going for this page too. Um, I Do you wanna share that, Clayton? Yes, let's see, let me get to this chat. And um, this is at voices.org slash coal impacts. 
Yes, it's in the it's a, it's in the Zoom chat. Um, and then, uh, yeah, yeah, Jamie. Um, oh no, you're getting the Linux boxes on oh. your share. <laughs> well, they're going away is it, now. Is it they're gone now? now? <laughs> Clean uses Linux. I. I'm Sorry. a proud Linux user, and it's Zoom's yeah. fault, not Linux's. Um, anyway, Jamie, um, if if you want to um, hop on and talk a little bit about this, and also I, I do think that probably more than more than just you have questions about how to address multiple mm -hmm. audiences with different reading levels and different levels of jargon. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, do do you want to talk? I think this is an open Zoom where you can just unmute yourself and talk. Yeah, it seems like it is. Hi, everybody. Hi, um, welcome. <laughs> so just to provide you with a little bit of background on this, um, we're, we've recently started uh, kind of trying to update our pages um, from the ground, you know, from the bottom up. And this is one of the first sections that we worked on. Mm -hmm. um, this is as far as I could get people with the text. I mean, I edited and edited, and this is as far as they would <laughs> let me go. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I need, what I'm looking for is what you mentioned if, as far as stakeholders is that um, kind of proof and evidence and, uh, you know, coming from experts and buy-in on how to, how to get them even in, in an even better scenario. So this is as far as I got them, but I feel like I got some words out, but I'd love more thoughts on this. <clears throat> and that can also show you a page with even more wall if you want. <laughs> so. Great. So Jamie, okay. can you talk a little bit about who your audience is for this page? <clears throat> Well, so that's also one of the problems is kind of the, it's kind of, um, uh, it's such a mixed bag. It's everyone from, from just general population that we want to take action all the way up to legislators and legislative offices that we want to read about this um, grant, right? You know, grant organizations that we want to read to fund our organization. Um, so it's, it's everything from you know, kind of more higher end and then even technical all the way to, hey, we want you to care about this issue. And so that's kind of the the problem that we're running into, of course, is it's, I think as a lot of people did. Um, but yeah, oh, and thank you, Danielle. I mean, I worked really hard on this, but it was a fight mm -hmm. to try to get it down to be this simple. Um, and so I still feel like it may be a wall of text. And again, I can show you some other ones, like I said, that are even more dense, so. Yeah, well, good for you for taking that on and, and having some success writing, rewriting it. I mean, that's the, that's, the, that's the first part and that's the hardest part. So, yeah, I mean, can I make a, while you're doing that, do you want me to say something about, um, about multiple audiences? And um, yes. Michelle, um, I know that you have multiple audiences at Social Innovation Forum too. Um, I mean, pretty much every organization that we work with has, has this problem. Um, and one thing I will say that from an accessibility standpoint, which is the most, the only standpoint I really truly care about just being transparent there. Um, <laughs> when you make something more accessible for one group, it doesn't mean that the, that other groups that don't need that level of accessibility are going to have um, any trouble with it. In fact, usually when you improve it for one group, you improve it for everyone. That's sort of the, um, that's one of the principles of, um, I think, universal design. Um, so it's like if you replace a doorknob with a lever, someone who can use a doorknob might also be holding two plates of food and be able to use the lever, right? Um, so yeah, um, that is, that's one argument to use with stakeholders that you're not shutting legislators out if you bring your reading level down from, I see it's 12 to, to grade nine. Mm -hmm. um, you can always consider starting a, a separate stream of content that is, you know, more, that is geared toward legislators um, and focus that in a, you know, you'll have opportunities to focus that if you're not trying to hit multiple audiences with the same content as well. But I know that that can be a capacity issue. Anyway, go ahead, Clayton. 
And Michelle, I don't know if you have anything to add there. Um, I was just going to add, uh, kind of going, thinking about stream of streams of content. Um, you know, one thing I think Dev Collaborative encouraged us to do is, you know, we make a lot of assumptions that all of our information should live on all of our pages um, when that's not necessarily the case. And so, one thing that we had talked about is auditioning what you need for the pages that you know are going to get the most traffic. Um, and so, I think thinking about, you know where are our assumptions on like what needs to be here? Um, and if this is kind of like an important page that like many different levels of stakeholders are visiting, um, what is the kind of almost bare bones content that needs to be on there? Um, and how do I make it as accessible as possible for everyone who's gonna be um, interacting with it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And another thing I'd say, uh, so one thing that I think this page could benefit from are some subheadings, and maybe this would be a easier to to get buy in from stakeholders because that's something where you're not convincing someone to cut a sentence that they feel like is important. Um, but that can break up this page and it can you know headings are great because then it gives you in like very immediately to the user. Like, oh, here's the information that that is on the page, um, you know, so I mean, right now it's going to be a bit arbitrary if I throw some in, but we can just do that. Um, you know, if it's like something like. Um, yeah, that's a good spot for, you know, black lung or coal. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. or it could be even more concise than this, right? Um, another thing that I do is I look for opportunities to break something out from a comma separated list and into a bulleted list. Uh, and so, um, you know, for example, you could do something like that. And the other thing is, um, <laughs> it, there's so much unlearning, right? Like. I got the gold stars from my English teacher for as many complex sentences as I could write. And yet it's like short and simple sentences are easier for us to read and skim and scan. So a big part of it is just breaking those complex sentences down into, you know, two simple sentences. So thousands of former mine sites still pose health and safety risks, um, you know, and it could even be something like environmental damage. Michelle and I were talking about, because Michelle has written grants and I was a grant writer as well. And you really get trained by grants to just write things that sound fancy in this really irritating way um, by a lot, a lot of funders. Like they, that's how they really kind of train you to write. And it, it, it's really hard to break those habits, especially if you're copying and pasting because you have no time. Yeah, I mean, we could kind yeah, of compromise is going to be okay, but it could be something else here too. Um, yeah, something like this, right? Okay. And now, now we've got that, and that's Very much nice. more scannable. Yeah. yeah. An another thing, again, this is something, this is me taking my own advice. Um, this is the like, there has been such and such, it's the whatever that like past past tense um where is it i saw it here earlier uh yeah many are trying to jump ship maybe is it oh there we go that have yeah uh if we change this we're also committing to, okay so there's two things here that um that are really common there's like a, a bunch of kind of helper words strung together. So we are also committed to ensuring that the communities that have long borne the brunt of mining are not left behind. Um, you know, so something like um, we make sure communities aren't left behind. Instead of we are committed to ensuring that people aren't, you know, there's a, there's a lot of that in the nonprofit world too, of like, we are working to ensure that people have the right to do such and such instead of like, we fight for people's rights. Um, 
Yeah, I'm, yeah, obviously even I'm guilty of that. I mean, my team is, they're great, but you know, we're all, we're all guilty. We get stuck in our own little echo chamber, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even what I rewrote could be simplified to like, we leave no one behind, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then that have long borne the brunt of mining. Yeah. So, so. Um, and that, that's something I learned when I learned Spanish, because I was always, I had such a hard time. I was like, he estado tratando, a, you know, and I'm like, wow, this is hard for me to understand in Spanish. I'm like, oh, I do that in English all the time. Um, yeah, we are determined to hold profit, coal profiteers. So we hold coal profiteers responsible for cleaning up the land and water um etc so you know as you can see yeah. it's like the red's already kind of coming away very nice yeah <clears throat> thank you yeah it's fantastic we've got another um we've got another candidate here from the aclu of northern california from stephen wilson um All right. jamie thank you so much for um for sharing thank you guys yeah. very much for going through that that was really helpful you're doing awesome. you're doing great <laughs> um so yeah this is a really interesting page too right because this is you know really trying hard to um to help someone walk walk someone through a really stressful situation. And actually, let me throw in another accessibility rah-rah thing that I have to say, which is that even when you know your audience has a high reading level, um, one situation where their reading level, their cognitive resources are reduced um, is when they're stressed out. I mean, I'm sure we've all experienced that. Um, and, you know, um, that actually can take someone's reading level way down the more stressed out they are. So another, another important principle that we use is to think about whether someone's coming to a web page under stress. And it should be simplified even more and made even as accessible as possible, even more if, if it's a page like this. And actually there's a lot going on here that's already um, an improvement over a wall of text. It could definitely be more of a wall of text than it is. There's mm -hmm. really good HTML structure I can see here. Um, yes, Jamie, it happens to everyone. I think during the pandemic, I can barely read anything. So um, I'm sure other people are <laughs> can relate. Um, Molly is asking, what are your thoughts on using accordions? Because I know that many designers and developers would come to this page and be like, well, just stick it all under an accordion. Please don't do that. Um, accordions can be awesome in certain use cases, but just imagine, just close your eyes and imagine for a second or don't close your eyes. I can't see you anyway. Um, you are Googling, um, what do I say when I want to remain silent? And this ACLU Northern California page comes up in Google results and you click on it and when you get there everything under if you are stopped for questioning do is hidden in an accordion that um that is um a frustrating user experience because um google will read things that are hidden under an accordion um visually hidden as you want them to so um, accordions, if, if you, if they load open can be okay, but like, that's, I feel like that is, is definitely a cop out in some ways, right? Because it's like, well, how are there other things we can do before we resort to an accordion here? Um, like, should this be broken up into multiple pages? Should it be an app? Like there's actually lots of questions to ask here, but I would say that, um, there's probably also some visual design treatment that could help with this page mm -hmm. um, in terms of icons and images breaking it up. I don't know totally. if Clayton or Michelle have, have thoughts. I had the same thought, like icons, icons for, you know, here's the situation in your car. 
here's a situation if you're taken to the police station. Um, or an infographic, right, I think can be helpful in these kinds of situations, which maybe is, you know, in this paper pamphlet. Um, can I, I yeah. interject and ask a question? With infographics, Absolutely. I have trouble because I'm usually uploading them as a uh, image and using and having to do alt text on an infographic is just like a time killer for the so you, yeah. type of team stuff that we have. So that usually turns into like a bullet list where a screen reader can read that automatically instead of uploading an infographic like image file without like, a, um, you know, sufficient alt text. So, um Quick note about alt text, um, and there there was a session yesterday, and and so you should check out the recording um, on alt text. Um, you do not have to enter any text in the alt attribute for an image that is decorative or design enhancement. Um, if so, if you took that image away, um, could would the content still make sense? If that's the case, then you can actually enter, you actually want the alt attribute to be there, but it, you can have it be blank and a screen reader will skip it. Of course, it can be annoying if you use a content management system, you have to make sure that your development team or your develop, whoever or you yourself figure out how to allow a blank alt um, attribute. Um, but that it is in fact true that um, you can add the visual design enhancements to help sighted users, but they they are not necessarily useful for, for people using a screen reader. And so you do not have to provide alt text in that situation. Um, oh, um, someone's asking, um, do you, does that answer your question, Stephen? Sorry. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I definitely want to go back and check out the recording. That, uh, yeah, yeah. Alt text is like is one of those things where it's really editorial um, and more and more like of an art than a science. But like, you know, um, accessibility checkers treat it like it's just like it's an on off switch. And of course, it's not like most things um, in life. Um, <laughs> and so they don't, the screen readers don't just read like the file name. Not, if you have that? blank, a blank alt attribute, or you use ARIA to say um, hidden, they will not read it. Okay. And so the blank alt is like the best, is like gold standard for, I am just visual enhancement, you do, you do not need me. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I do. I, I do want to show one thing from our from what we prepared uh, because it's a it's a common thing that we see. Uh, so the social innovator accelerator page. Um, so this is one that we're working on rewriting for the new site. And what you're seeing here, if you were to um, inspect this and look at the HTML. Um, you would see that like this text here is a heading for um, most likely what happened is that, you know, the person who originally wrote this wanted this to be in all caps and in bold. And they knew that in their WYSIWYG editor that that heading for style was going to transform that text into all caps. And so they wanted to use that style. Um, but semantically on the page, you always want your headings to follow, just like in an outline of heading one is the page title, the, the, the next heading that you use on the page should be heading two. If there's any subheading of that, then that's a heading three, et cetera. And so using, um, using out of order headings um, affects your search engine optimization because it tells Google like this is important but not as important as this and it's also um, kind of messes with people's screen reader experience because you can jump from different headings and if your screen reader is like oh here's a heading four then that kind of throws things off um, so that's one thing when you're working on content is just to double check and make sure that editors aren't using headings just kind of for um, 
aesthetic style purposes and are using it semantically appropriately. Um, and the other thing that's kind of related to this is that um, all, all caps is helpful um, if it's just a word or two, maybe three. But after that, it becomes it actually becomes more difficult to read. Um, so that's something that we'll be changing about this page is just um, changing that back to um, you know regular casing and not using um, the heading tag for that particular area. Um, and yeah, I think that's what all I wanted to to specifically say about that. Um, although we could go through more of that process, but maybe yeah, is it I. Anything else in the chat? Any specific questions anybody has or points? I have a anybody? question about what you just said about headings. That's fascinating. Yeah. I've never, I never knew that. So in this example, like if you scroll down, mm -hmm. is eligibility requirements then prioritized by Google's crawlers because it is such a, it's like heading two or heading one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So that's really important then to make all of your headings something you want Google to catch. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, it's uh, like anything SEO related, you want to still make sure that you're writing naturally and not kind of don't feel like you have to overdo it. Um, but just know that that they are taking that into account. Yeah. Cool. So Thanks. one of the things that I just try and, and encourage people to do, you can get um, if you use Chrome or Firefox, they there are these extensions that will actually sh quickly show you the outline of your page in html because even though html like seems like like what is html what's this point i don't get it like it's really very 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 basic and kind of silly machines are pretty stupid and they have no idea what you mean when you um present a bunch of text on, on a web page. And you're using HTML to tell machines, computers, web browsers, and screen readers, and Google, who also cannot see with eyes your content, what, what is important on the page, um, and some sort of um, structural hierarchy of your words. So there's one called that I use called like SEO has a terrible name. It's like seo-extension.com. And it's, I use it um, in Chrome. And oh, wow, their website has an error, but the extension still works. And it's just like a little um, add-on to your browser and you can pop open an outline of your content and see what it looks like. Um, oh gosh, there's another good question. Am I derailing you, Clayton? I'm sorry. Is it the 500 word recommendation? Because that's a good point. We should kind of talk about that. Yes. Yeah, oh, so, so this yeah, is, go ahead. Uh, so, so Tammy makes a note, SEO experts tell me every page should have at least 500 words. How can we balance that with your suggestions? So this is a really good example again of like, this is, this is my opinion, but I think it's, a, I think it's the right one because it's mine. Um, <laughs> There, there's certain kind of SEO advice out there that I feel like becomes overly formulaic. And this is a good example of one. Um, if you've got, you know, like the, that landing page that we showed earlier of, you know, we're listing the so social innovator accelerator, the capacity camps, the alumni network, it's essentially like an interstitial page onto other sub pages. I wouldn't follow. I wouldn't follow that 500 word minimum, right, for a page like that. And the the nice thing about Google becoming more and more sophisticated, you know, there's like the dystopian, uh, like scariness of Google. But one thing that they're doing is they're becoming more and more sophisticated now, where um, you just need to write content that's relevant to your readers is the most important thing when it comes to search engine optimization. Um, and so you don't have to stick to that like hard and fast rule um, and, and other kind of rules like that. Um, so yeah, 
uh, I would say like you want your page to be natural. You want it to read natural. Um, if you are at like a decision point of whether something is kind of breaking from an SEO convention that you learned, if it's going to make something read weird or kind of artificial, then it's almost almost always not worth worth doing to meet the like to check that SEO checkbox. Um, uh, how much formatting is too much formatting? <laughs> yeah. However much formatting I, I add is too much, I can tell you. That has been true since 1999. I bold everything and I'm like, oh, I bolded everything. That's bad. Um, <laughs> this is why is, designers yeah. exist. <laughs> Which a related note, yeah, underlining. Yeah, you should really um, avoid under, underlining is, is conveyed with links. Um, so yeah, you, generally you should use other ways to emphasize something other than an underline. Um, unless it is an actual link. Um, that is a very good point. Um, yes. I think we're at time, but um, um, I'm, and I'm sorry we started a little late, but I just wanted to thank everyone so much for being here and um, for being so chatty and contributing stuff and sharing your stuff. And you can reach us, um, our, our Twitter handles and emails are in the collaborative notes. Um, and thank you, Michelle, also for being here today. And um, yeah, have a great NTC and hopefully in person next year. <laughs>